we have the remnants of the document that we've been addressing the last couple of weeks in front of us. And shall we begin our conversation for today? So before we, uh, before we start, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his direction? Gracious Father in heaven, as we assemble today before you, we thank you for the hours of the Sabbath. We thank you for the week that has passed, for the blessings that you have provided, for the directions that you have given us so that we may do that which you would most want us to do. Help us so that our characters may become more in line with yours. Direct us now so that we might understand more clearly that which is required of us. We pray for those that are not with us today. We ask for your watch care and your guidance with Theodore and Heidi as they look to travel. Help us now. Show us that which you would have us to do. Help them so that those that come in contact with them may be blessed and may see your character. Direct our conversation now. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Now, there's been quite a bit that we have been looking at regarding this apostasy that had occurred with Brethren McCullough and Hawkins in Australia. The last couple of paragraphs from this document that was sent out are now before us. It is the privilege of God's people to go forth to their work in the strength of Jesus. As this statement is made, since this is saying we are to go forth to their work in the strength of Jesus, are we then to go forth in our own strength? Let's recall. No. Okay, thank you. Let's recall what we were studying last night. What did we understand was happening after the General Conference meeting in 1888? Were the leaders of the church at that time going forth to their work in the strength of Jesus? They were in their own strength. Okay. As Mrs. White writes... We should go forth, not depending upon our talents, but wrestling with God for sanctification through the truth. Is sanctification important? Just a little bit. Okay. With sanctification, are we sanctified when we come to the foot of the cross? No. No, we're not. Okay. If we are going to look at sanctification as a step, would we say it's the equivalent of the first, the second, or the third angel's message? The second. Okay. So if we are looking within the sanctuary, sanctification begins to occur where? In the sanctuary. In the holy place. Exactly. Now, as Mrs. White continued with this, we should feel a constant assurance that Jesus is present to help us. If success attends our labors, we should give all the glory to God. The frail, defective beings of earth should not take one particle of honor to themselves. The worker for God is to be clothed with humility. For Christ has condescended to be his helper. Paul may plant and Apollos may water, but it is God that gives the increase. What does this say to us today? It says we all have our parts to play in God's work. So if we are, if we are casting seed, if we are showing others what it means to take on the character of Christ, should we be upset if we don't see immediate results? 
No. Should we be frustrated if the results come from secondary efforts? I mean, the sentence we just read, Paul may plant and Apollos may water, but it is God that gives the increase. So if Paul has planted and Apollos comes along later and begins to water, are we to be upset that our efforts did not give the results that that of an Apollos has given? No. Okay. We shall have to meet many false doctrines and deceptive theories, and it will require more than human intelligence to discern their falsity and to keep clear of their influence. How many of us today have faced those that are saying there is no Holy Spirit? How many of us today have faced those that are saying that Uriah Smith is a prophet as was Ellen White? We look at this. We are going to find doctrines that are not correct. We are going to find these that are deceptive. Are we to depend upon our own mental abilities to be able to withstand these type of issues? Supposed to rely on Jesus Christ. Exactly. Many claim sanctification who are wholly deceived in themselves. And we should inquire, how can we present their deceptions in a true light? That souls may be delivered from the snare of the enemy. There is only one test for all doctrines. And that is God's great standard of righteousness. Says the prophet, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, It is because there is no light in them. Many of those who claim sanctification present themselves like the enemy of God and his law in the garments of their own righteousness. They oppose the commandments of God and show that their heart is carnal. Many years after the crucifixion of Christ, the apostle wrote these words that test the profession of those who claim holiness and yet oppose the law of God. The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Over these last several weeks, we have been looking at Zechariah 4. And as we have looked at this with Zechariah 4, we have been given this admonition, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Why is this important for us to understand today? Does this not show us that we have the need for total reliance upon Christ? Yeah. Now, letter 48 of 1897. It's kind of interesting. We covered a little bit about this this last week. Now, there are portions of this letter that I did not include in the document that I sent out on Zechariah 4. I'm going to read a little bit from this letter, and then we're going to go into these paragraphs that are before us. The lessons of Christ drew all kinds of people together, many of whom professed to receive the truth. Some followed the disciples, as did Ananias and Sapphira, who acted a lie to get credit for liberality, that others might think they were sacrificing all. But God read their pretension, for he is the searcher of all hearts. Your screen is in the wrong place. We can't see what you're reading. 
Okay. The reason I, I'm, I'm running two different screens right now and I don't have the other one up before me. Okay. Okay. I apologize. But, but that's paragraph 13 of letter 48 of 1897. Now, the lessons of Christ drew all kinds of people together, many of whom profess to receive the truth. Have we seen this type of situation occur historically within the history that we have studied? So my direct question is, did this occur during the time of the Millerites? Think of it this way. When William Miller was giving his messages from 1833 to 1843, were there many that came forward to accept the teachings of Father Miller? And did these continue to hold to these truths through the disappointments of 1843 and 1844? No. A lot. Did this same type of situation occur within the present truth movement? Yeah. So are we seeing history repeated? Mm hmm Okay. Now, paragraph 14 from this letter 48 of 1897 gives reference to the book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 19 to 23. Can someone please look this up and read these verses? So that's Acts 8, verses 19 to 23. Let us know when you when you find this. I've got it. <clears throat> Saying, okay. give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee. Because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Okay. Now, this paragraph expands on this just a little bit, okay? This is, in, this is giving reference to the baptism of a man by the name of Simon Magus. Simon Magus was baptized, but he thought that the Holy Ghost could be purchased with money. He offered the disciples money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But with holy indignation, Peter answered, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. How many today have we known that came into this movement, that came to professedly understand what was being said. Yet, they didn't understand the sacrifice that was required. Did Simon Magus look to give his whole heart when he was baptized? No. Now, I was away from the Adventist church for, for a, a many number of years. I come back in to a church I no longer recognize. I've said this many times in the past. I got involved with one, with one church. I was a little surprised because two families wanted to see a member of their family baptized. 
one family, very working class, very blue collar, worked hard all their lives, had a son that had gotten himself into trouble. Now, the pastor looked at this son and said, well, in order for you to be baptized, we're going to have to have a baptismal class. We're going to need to study to make sure that you understand what it means to be baptized. And maybe, maybe in, a, in two or three months, we can consider this. Now, on the other side, son-in-law of a former doctor looked to be baptized. The pastor said to him, great, we're going to have a church camp out in a couple of weeks. Why don't we do it then? Were either of these positions presented by the pastor the way that Christ or the disciples would have approached the situation? The first one. Okay. So on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, should the disciples have baptized the 3,000? They didn't hold a baptismal class. It looks to me like so, uh, the, the, the sermon sufficed as, as a baptismal class because it says people were cut to the heart and said, what must we do to be saved? So they were convicted. Right. Now, I'm not being critical of the answers. All answers are good for discussion. In this situation, what was surprising for me when they went ahead to do the baptismal for the second party, I was there. I am watching the person that is wanting to be baptized. The pastor is willing to go forward with the baptism. As this person put out his cigarette and chose to be baptized. And he later admitted to me directly that he was high when he was baptized. Was this second person any different than Simon Magus? Was his whole heart being given to Christ? No. In these situations, both were still in bondage. In this situation, the pastor was yet in bondage as well. We are to have clean hands and clean heart. If we are going to be represented by the golden bowls through which the golden oil is poured and provided to the world, are those golden bowls that we see in Zechariah to have any impurity, any spot or wrinkle within them? No, they're not. Now, this letter continued. Sharp testimonies must be born. Testimonies that reveal sin. Is it pleasant for us to have to undergo a testimony that reveals sin? It is often difficult to make the impression upon human minds that must be made to enable them to distinguish sacred, eternal interests from common things. The witness for God often repeats truth clearly and distinctly, and he thinks, there is no more to be said now. But there are those who, like Simon Magus, think that sacred things of God are merchandise. There are learned men who, like Nicodemus, say, how can these things be? God's worker is then grieved and astonished. 
Disappointment comes and he says, what's the use of working? Clear and striking arguments, illustrations appropriate and right to the point, earnestness and hope to save a soul from death. All have failed to arouse the benumbed senses. Because the failure of his efforts, his heart becomes discouraged. Because he has planted and he is not seeing the growth, he becomes discouraged. But this will never do. We are to remember that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. The carnal mind is as dark as midnight. And its illumination must come from the Holy Spirit. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. The most simple representation will be the most effective. The work is to be done by every believing child of God. None are to fail or be discouraged in their service for the master. Whatever the ignorance of spiritual things is shown by learned men. We are going to be placed where we will be standing before others that view themselves as greatly learning. Yet, do they have spiritual eyesight if they are not walking according to God's commandments? Do not begin at once to talk of temporal things, but let the people understand that you have come as a loving, sympathizing heart to save them from sin to save them from ruin. Women can often do this delicate work better than men. Earnest, God-fearing women can do a precious work for the master. This kind of work is the remedy for lukewarm, selfish, covetous souls. They will, if they work to save others, melt away the cold, icy atmosphere which has surrounded their souls. There are many times that I have seen sisters have much better empathy, much better ability to reach than the most brilliant discourses given by a pastor or a learned man. The Lord is soon to come, and we have only a remnant of time in which to work. What does it mean to us right now that we have only a remnant of time? How can we consider this? Does this mean we have only a short time that we, that a remnant of time is just a a small part of a time or a year? You may be often disappointed because you find your earnest loving interest meets with no response. But the experience of the greatest teacher the world ever knew is before you. He was refused. He was opposed. He was rejected. He was derided. Let us consider our Savior's life and say, I will not fail nor be discouraged. The system of labor, of personal labor, will do a work that few anticipate. To carry it out in the spirit of Jesus because you are conscious you are doing him service will oft prove a cross. But bear in mind that the Holy Spirit is the worker. The human agent working for God is not alone. How many times do we feel as if we are being beaten down? Yet how many times do we forget that we are not alone? Labor in perseverance, in tenderness, in compassion, in prayerfulness, and love will do more than sermons. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus, in giving his life for the saving of the world from the curse of sin, intended greater things than our eyes have yet witnessed. <clears throat> What does this mean to to you? What is this showing? Now, read with me this next statement. The Holy Spirit 
is waiting for channels through whom to work. What does this mean to us today? How do you take this at this time? Um, the Holy Spirit is waiting for channels through whom to work because nobody is working. <laughs> or few are working. What is Christ waiting for? The manifestation of the, uh, the manifestation of his people. I mean, how did it say, how did it go? The, for God's people to, oh, I knew the quote, but I can't get it. Ma- manifest his character. Okay. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Sorry. Is, is it also not correct that Christ, the bridegroom, is waiting for the bride to make herself ready. How can you have a wedding if the bride is not ready to get married? Can that go forward? No. So Christ is waiting. The Holy Spirit is waiting. If they are waiting, then is God the Father waiting as well if one and the other are waiting i would have to say that god the father has been waiting to see are we ready for christ coming are we ready for the wedding if all would do the work to which they were appointed thousands of people might be saved The adversary will not always triumph. The spirit of God will be poured out upon the church just as soon as the vessels are prepared to receive it. How do you, how how do you take that kind of a statement? What is this saying to you today? How long shall the faith of the people of God remain so limited, remain so narrow? Why not exercise faith that the Holy Spirit shall so increase in large measure in divine blessings and intensify human agencies that the glory of the Lord shall be revealed? Where's the problem? It's in us, ain't it? Exactly. Brothers and sisters, God is willing to pour out his great blessings upon us. Is God able to do that? He is. But what happens if these blessings are poured out and no one is ready to receive them? Would only move on to another one? Well, the statement before this, the Spirit of God will be poured out upon the church just as soon as the vessels are prepared to receive it. If you were to pour them out, they would be wasted because no one, no one's ready. That's my point. Well taken, brother. Well stated. Who, who is stopping the Spirit of God from being poured out? Consider this carefully. We cannot go forward. We cannot become these vessels if our characters are not pure. How do our characters become pure? How do they become righteous? Through the furnace of affliction. Okay. What was our study about last night? Righteousness by faith. Thank you. So how do we become righteous? We are in the furnace of affliction. Yes. But we are to have faith as we are in that furnace. That what is being done. Is being done so that we may become righteous that our faith may become pure 
Does that make sense? Amen. Yes. The power of the Holy Spirit is needed to chase away our unbelief and our unchristlike attributes. We must see our need of a physician. We are sick and do not know it. May the Lord convert the hearts of his workmen. When there is a converted ministry, then look for results. Kind of surprising to see that kind of a comment, isn't it? I would have thought that all ministers are converted. But what is Mrs. White saying here? They're not converted. So we have an unconverted ministry presenting to an unconverted church, presenting of the great need of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, yet the how, the Holy Spirit may be falling on hearts all around us, yet not falling on ours. The blind leading the blind. Thank you. Can we convert our own hearts? No. Mrs. White's correct. She's very direct here. You cannot convert your own hearts. This work can only be wrought by the Holy Spirit. In every stage of the work, let the educators advance. The question has been asked, what kind of vessels does the Spirit ordinarily use? What does Christ say? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30. When the workers in any branch of the work labor in self, they put upon themselves a yoke which Christ does not cooperate with them in carrying. Are we to continue working? in our own estimated methods. No. We need to work in Christ's methods. Thank you. Now, Brother William. Yes. Would you please read these next two highlighted sentences? The question has been asked. What no, kind? Drop down. All right. What kind of vessels are meet for the master's use? Empty vessels. What does that say to you? I need to be an empty vessel for him. How about you, Brother Ryan? What does this say to you? It means uh, we have to be emptied of self uh, so that we're completely empty. Okay. Brother McDonald, what does this say to you? Self has to die. Does it also not mean that the vessel will have gone through the fire of affliction? Amen. Amen. What happens to that vessel when it goes through the fire of affliction? It... Um... It starts off as dross, and then it becomes gold. Okay. When you're seeing gold become purified, there are impurities in the metal that will burn in the fire. When those impurities are being burned, you think that the gold might be become destroyed. How does the refiner know that the gold has become purified? When the drop hits the, comes to the top? Well, when you watch when you watch a refiner of gold or silver, they are looking for one thing and one thing alone. The they, gold. Go ahead. 
the gold becomes translucent and you can like a mirror. Thank you. You're able to see yourself in the gold, right? Yes. Who is the refiner? Who is our great refiner today, sister? Jesus Christ. So this mirror is then the symbol for the character that we are to have. Would that be correct? Yes. When we empty the soul from every defilement, we are clean vessels. Are we emptied of self? Are we cured of selfish planning? Whereby we are to be given every favorable chance while others get along as best they can? Oh, for less self-occupation. May the Lord purify and cleanse his people, his teachers, his churches. Is it necessary for the church to become purified? Yes. The Lord has given a rule for the guidance of all. From this standard, there can be no careless departure. But there has been and still is a swerving from righteous principles. How long shall this condition of things exist? How can the master use us as vessels for holy service until we empty ourselves and make room for the spirit of God to work? Now, we've addressed this in the past. Can the Holy Spirit take residence in a heart that is filled with self? No. No. What does that say to us today? It's interesting to me that so many of these admonitions, so many of these points had been given by Mrs. White well over 130 years ago, yet we're not seeing their effect within the church today. Now, the comment in the quotes in the chat says I'm reminded of the quote possibly from a hymn when Satan tempts me to despair reminded me reminding me of guilt within upward I look and see Christ there who made an end of all my sin now what is the goal that Mrs. White said that we should attain to we should attain to Christ's righteousness has she also not stated that we should attain to becoming one of the 144,000? Yes. Amen. What does it mean for us to become one of the 144,000? The, um, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. The 144,000 are those who are not killed and live to see Christ. Okay. But that hundred, those 144,000 are going to be those that follow the lamb wherever he goeth, right? Is this right. not what's told in, in Revelation? Yes? Yes. Now, are these ones that are reflecting Christ's character? Yeah. Yeah. So does this not say to us that we need to be prepared to reflect Christ's character before all with whom we come in contact? Mm -hmm. The word of truth should ever be in mind and heart. And those who believe the truth should be prepared to speak the word in season. The seed of truth, sown in a few well-chosen words, may appear to have but a small beginning, but that word spoken from the heart may take root and spring up and bear abundant harvest of truth. In ourselves, we can do nothing. We are all weak. But if we make the most of the Lord's entrusted talent, his divine power will give us efficiency. 
the great apostle exclaims, who is sufficient for these things? 2 Corinthians 2.16. But many whose sphere of influence seem narrow and weak, their abilities limited, their opportunities few, their knowledge not extended, their influence small, may, if they will let the peace of God rule in their hearts, do as much good and more than those who have efficiency, especially especially if they trust to their efficiency. It is not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. The strength and the talent belong to God. And who can estimate the great work that may be done in the sowing of the gospel seed? If it will be as a morsel of leaven hidden in the meal. How are we to tell where the seed falls? Some seed will fall on well-prepared ground. Some seed will fall on stony ground. Some seed will fall where it, it isn't going to look to grow at all. How are we to be the ones to tell? It's not our responsibility. It's That's God's responsibility. Exactly. In taking upon himself humanity, Christ is connected by relationship to the whole human family. But to any church, this relation is of no avail without a personal faith. The identification of heart and mind and soul and strength with Jesus Christ. In thoughts and desires, in words and actions, there must be an identity with Christ, a constant imparting of his spiritual life. And it is in thus constantly receiving and constantly imparting that which we receive that makes us elements of light. Are we to let our light shine or are we to cover it in a basket? Let it shine. If we're allowing it to shine, then we are becoming elements of the light. We are then, as the moon, reflecting the Son of God, right? Correct. Now, here again, Mrs. White quotes from Zechariah 4, verses 1 and 2 and 4 through 6. We've covered this multiple times. But now, from verses 11 to 14. Then I answered, then answered I, and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? Why is it important for us to know about these olive trees that are on the right and the left? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. How is the dry, disconnected sapling to become one with the parent vine stock? How is it to be made a partaker of the life and the nourishment of the living vine? Only by being grafted into the vine, by being brought into the closest relationship possible. Fiber by fiber, vein by vein, the twig holds fast to the life-giving vine until the life of the vine becomes one with the branch. And the branch produces fruit like that of the vine. Are we today seeking to become one with the vine of heaven? Or are we looking to become one with the vine of the rebellion? Where are we today? 
There's a lot for us to consider, brothers and sisters. There's a lot for us to try to understand. Now, our time is coming to a close today. Do we have any other comments, thoughts, or questions at this point? I have a, a question about one of the paragraphs you read. Okay. And maybe you can answer this question later if it's not totally relevant, but what's the difference between imparting and imputing? Okay. As I would understand it, there are many times that items are imparted. In other words, being freely given. And it's up to the one to whom this is imparted to accept it. Imputed to me gives the gives the thought of not only being given, but that it is being freely and completely accepted. Okay, thank you. Okay. Now, I stand ready to be corrected on that. Okay, now from the chat, I am being corrected. Thank you. Imputed is justification. Imparted, sanctification. So here, being imputed would be the same as coming to the foot of the cross. We've made a decision. We have to make the decision, though, to go forward. If we go forward, imparted we are then accepting the sanctification we are accepting the fire of affliction because we cannot go forward in sanctification if we are not willing to undergo the experience so thank you shall we now now close with prayer Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this time today. We thank you for all of the participation and the blessings that you brought before us. Help us now to look to be prepared, to be guided, to be directed as you see necessary so that we may become the vessels that are necessary to receive your outpouring of your spirit. Direct us this day. Help us in all things. For this we thank you and this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.